It was the height of the Enlightenment, reason reigning supreme, when in the summer of 1758, Andre Morellet was visiting a friend, a, actually a high-ranking church official over in Rome, pursuing the shelves of his host, as I am sure all of us are out there want to do, without the least bit of judgment, of course. His eye caught a vast tome in folio, ominously the spine read, Directorium Inquisitorum, a church institution that still struck horror, still strikes horror. It evokes images of torture, dank dungeons, and burning flesh. And upon opening it, he was revolted with what he saw, the presumption of guilt and even demonic possession of suspected heretics, instructions for deceiving those suspects into confessing that meant excruciating death and detailed instructions for when and how to apply torture that could only end in just those confessions. To share his disgust and contempt for what he took as the worst excesses of the medieval religious depravity that Enlightenment people so despised, he published excerpts of the Inquisitor's Manual in 1762. The men of the Enlightenment referred to the text as a monument of atrocity and ridiculousness, and Voltaire realized that Candide should have killed a few more than just one inquisitor. And a few decades later over in America, Edgar Allan Poe would include the Directorium Inquisitorum in his litany of shocking and horrible volumes pondered by those within the walls of the doomed house of Usher. Alongside Malleus Maleficarum, the work of the 14th century Catalan inquisitor Nicholas Emmerich came to represent absolute horror, the absolute horrors of human cruelty manifest by religious dogma run amok. Indeed, it took none less than Mein Kampf to steal that satanic throne from Malleus and from the directorium of Emmerich. But shock and disgust are not education, and only education can actually prevent those horrors from re-emerging. Thus, to understand the Directorium Inquisitorum, we must turn back to the Inquisition of the 14th century. Here we'll see the Inquisition in transition from its triumph over the Cathars to extend its reach into emergent other so-called heresies and to becoming an enduring European religious institution. Indeed, the most decisive extension of the Inquisition will be the addition of magic to the realm of heresy, one that would set the stage for the witch trials of the early modern period. Let's explore the Inquisition of the 14th century, specifically by studying these, these manuals of the Inquisition that bookend the 14th century, the Practica Inquisitationis Hereticae Pravitatis of Bernard Guy, completed sometime around 1325, and the increasingly horrible Directorium Inquisitorum of Nicholas Emmerich, completed around 1376. If you're interested in the history of magic, hermetic philosophy, alchemy, Kabbalah, or just the history of things like this in the occult, make sure to subscribe here to Esoterica and check out my numerous other content on topics in esotericism. Also, if you want to support work like this, long form, scholarly, accessible, and free content on topics in esotericism here for free on YouTube, I'd hope you consider supporting my work over at Patreon with a one-time donation. You can use the super thanks below the video. You can pick up some cool black metal merch and you can support the channel making long form content like this. I mean, I didn't exactly mean to make an hour plus video on the 14th century inquisition, but it happened. And if you want to support work like that, take a look at my Patreon. But now to the manuals of the Inquisition of the 14th century, the Inquisition that saw the burning of Joan of Arc, the execution of the last Cathars, the immolation of Marguerite Perret, and the persecution and suppression of the Templars, and the heretifaction, the making of heresy of magic itself. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane and history philosophy, and religion.
As you might have guessed, this episode is actually the second in our series on the origins and developments of the Medieval Inquisition. Now, you might want to go check out that first episode either to better inform this one, or you can check it out afterwards to get a more full vision of how the Inquisition developed prior to this episode that takes place primarily in the 14th century. But this episode does basically pick off where the other one left off, and it covers the rise of the Medieval Inquisition. Now, to clear up any confusion, which seemed rather endemic, weirdly enough, in the comments section last time and before the ninth person leaves the Monty Python joke, this is a series about the Medieval Inquisition. The medieval one. Not the much later Spanish and Roman Inquisitions that began in the 16th century. This episode spanned the Inquisition as it was in the 14th century, the 1300s. That's about 200 years prior to the rise of the Spanish and Roman Inquisitions. Also, while the Spanish and Roman Inquisitions were truly affairs of state, they were state-backed and all the more horrible for it, it would be wrong to think of the medieval Inquisition as a fully institutionalized office of either the church or the state at this period. Rather, around this time, it's better to think of inquisitions as more of ad hoc sorties, little battles against perceived heresy in a region, with some of them being more or less institutionalized, though as we'll see by the end of the 14th century, institutionalization of the Inquisition, the Inquisition, will certainly be on the agenda. Also, just a note on my use of the word heresy for this episode. I'm going to be using the terms heresy and heretic from the point of view of the Inquisition, which puts me in a weird position. But rather than just saying all the time so-called heresy and so-called heretic every single time I want to use that term, I'm certainly not on team medieval church, much less on team Inquisition, God forbid, and I don't want my language use to muddle that fact. I'm literally making episodes like this, content like this, in the hopes that we can learn from history and actively resist the combination of church and state, which some hideous morons in this country are flirting with again, along with resisting any form of social power which stems from basically medieval conspiracy theories. It's, in fact, even arguable to what extent some of these heresies existed in the medieval period in the first place. So, again, I use the term heretic and heresy as just a shorthand, and definitely not an endorsement of anything argued in this episode. But, as we saw last time, the medieval inquisition, or rather the technical title of the time, the Inquisitio Hereticae Pravitatis, the investigation into heretical depravity, or depravity, the heretics were depraved, it's an ironic title if you ask me, evolved primarily in order to suppress both alleged dualists in the re region of southern France and northern Italy, known to history now as the Cathars, as much as they really existed, but also other radical Catholics who took the spiritual importance of apostolic poverty of central and literal, very literal value with the poverty. The Waldensians and eventually the spiritual Franciscans, along with the even later Apostolic Brethren, or the Pseudo-Apostles as they're known to the Inquisition, argued that literal poverty, radical poverty, was a sine qua non of Christian piety, and that the Church had basically betrayed all that for pomp and luxury and decadence. I mean, St. Francis did tell the Pope that uh, Peter had no silver and gold any longer. Whew, what a bamf. So much so that the Apostolic Brethren actually held that the Church of Rome was basically the Antichrist. In order to deal with these renegade movements, the Church actually first employed Cistercian preachers to properly educate the population, and then eventually they began to incorporate some of these preachers of poverty into the Church as the mendicant orders, the mendicant orders, the begging poor orders, especially the Franciscans and the Dominicans who the Dominicans would themselves go on to become the shock troops of the early Inquisition. However, following the assassination of a papal legate in 1208 and the blatant desire on the part of northern lords for southern land in France, the Albigensian Crusade was launched from 1209 to 1229 and proved to be a horrifying bloodbath of siege and massacre of civilians in the Languedoc that is difficult to describe, and it was in the aftermath of that nightmare that a new nightmare began. The Inquisition sought to root out and destroy any remaining vestiges of heresy in the region in the 50 years that followed, with the last Cathar Perfectus being burned alive 
in the autumn of 1321. Again, if you want more of a primer on the origins and the mechanisms by which the early Inquisition operated, you're going to want to check out the first episode in this series because you need to know more about that stuff because it's horrifying and we don't want to do it again. Also, if you want to learn more about Cathar beliefs and theology, if again, or if they really existed, frankly, I've also made a little Cathar playlist. I've made a little Cathar playlist. You can check that. You can check that out too. That was weird. But by the early 14th century, the subject of this video, the Inquisition over the Cathars was basically coming to a conclusion with the Cathars nearing annihilation and the Waldensians now being pushed way off into the mountain regions of Italy, where they actually survive down to this day. There's still Waldensians out there. Waldensians, well done. You beat the Inquisition. You should get like a reward for that. There should be a statue because you beat the Inquisition. But with the defeat of Catharism imminent and the first generations of the growing pains for the Inquisition complete, we began to see the first systematic treaties by Inquisitors actually reflecting on the very process and office of the Inquisition itself. In a sense, the first generation of the Inquisition was very much a startup. It was in startup mode, more or less making things up as they went, you know, basing themselves on canon law and theology, but a lot of it was kind of ad hoc. But with the end of that startup phase of the Inquisition came the earliest inklings of self-reflections by the Inquisitors upon the very office they had helped to create. And this couldn't have come sooner at a better time. And as I mentioned in the introduction, new heresies were on the horizon. Well, or at least they were making new heresies up, the 14th century would see the burning of Joan of Arc, it would see the burning of the Bechin, Marguerite Perret, the persecution and suppression of the Templars, don't, uh, don't loan the King of France any money, and the heretification of, well, magic, all of it. The annihilation of the Cathars would only prove to be the opening salvo in the medieval war against heresy, and by 1317, the final canon powers of church law would be given over to the Inquisition. In a sense, the Inquisition saw itself become the little I Inquisition. Well, the baby Inquisition grew up. It became self-conscious of itself. It, it became the Inquisition. Now, to better understand that process, this episode is going to explore the development of the 14th century Inquisition by turning to a series of Inquisitional manuals composed during that century. The first is going to be the Practica Inquisitionis Heretici Provitatis of Bernard Guy, completed sometime around 1325, and the frankly horrible Directorium Inquisitorum of Nicholas Emmerich, completed sometime around 1376, about 50 years later. And to a lesser degree, we'll take a look at some of the anonymous texts like De Officio that was composed sometime between 1320 and 1325, along with Uglini's Tractatus Super Materia Heterocororum, composed around 1330. Now, Bernard Guy was a true soldier of the church. Born to minor gentry, he became a Dominican early on and served in various leadership roles, slowly climbing up the church hierarchy. He was studious and careful. His inquisitorial manual is only a minor work compared to his other mountain of literature he produced, for instance, on history. And it was perhaps this investigative mind, along with a penchant for diplomacy, he was a diplomat, that led him to becoming chief inquisitor of Toulouse from 1307 to 1323. Even his being appointed bishop didn't take him away from his duties in what was among that time the final outposts of Catharism. However, it would be during his posting that the final Cathar Perfectus would actually be burned in 1321, in the Inquisition of Palmier, led by Jacques Fournier, who would later become Pope Benedict XII. So, the Inquisitor to Pope Pipeline. That was a thing. Guy composed the Practica about two years after his retirement from the post of Inquisitor, and it was made as a guide for those who would succeed him in that post. The Practica, while written in 1325 and surviving in six manuscripts, wouldn't even be published in a modern edition until 1886, and it still has no contemporary critical edition, much less an English translation, though some chunks of it are translated. It's a very strange book to modernize, to be honest, and, and not just because of the whole, you know, torturing heretics aspect. 
It's composed of five parts, many of which are just various documents and legal forms and formula to stitch together with some commentary. The first covers documents and formulas for summoning a suspected heretic and excommunicating those that refuse to show up. Remember, in the early Inquisition, they could call you and you could just run off. The Waldensians just ran the hell off. The second and third are similar formulas for use during the sermones, or sermons, in which heretics are variously condemned or given penances, along with the various kinds of oaths that were expected to be sworn by secular powers to support and back the Inquisition. Often a rather turbulent affair, as we'll see. It wasn't always happy between the Inquisition and the secular arm. The fourth section are the various canon laws describing the office of the Inquisition, basically justifying the Inquisition's existence, along with the acceptable behavior of an Inquisitor, the kind of things you're expected to do and not to do. Finally, the fifth and the most well-known section, in fact the only part of the Book of the Practica translated into English, details how to conduct interrogations, the nature of various sects, along with a kind of questionnaire to be used by the Inquisitor, known as an interrogatoria, that is specific to each form of heresy. It's a tailor-made questionnaire to kind of diagnose a heretic as you're talking to them. It also includes the final formulas for the most important aspect of the Inquisition, the abjuration, in which the convicted heretic secures absolution from the church via the Inquisitor. In some sense, it's the whole point of the Inquisition, at least from the point of view of the church. Now, the first three sections are absolutely the most obscure to contemporary eyes, especially for those of y'all who, you know, don't read medieval religious legal texts all day. But uh, the best way to think about these sections is if you've ever needed to fill out like a legal form, like a promissory note for a loan or a house lease or a bill of sale, and you just go to some website, like a law website, I don't know, bestlawforms.com, and you, you download some PDF with a bunch of lawyer jibber jabber, and you just plug in a bunch of names and dates and signatures and things, and you go down to the bank or the post office and you get it notarized and wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, magically you have a legally binding document. Maybe. I'm not a lawyer. I don't know. Well, those first sections of the Practica are kind of a version of that. They're just a bunch of documents that were developed in the first generation of the Inquisition that were now organized and formalized by Guy, such that if you, I don't know, you needed a summons document to drag someone in to in question about their heresy situation, the wording of a local lord to swear support to the Inquisition, or you need them to declare that they're going to go out there and capture some heretics, or the official wording to seize property from a converted heretic and turn it into a trash heap. By the way, that's what you would do. You would take the heretic's property and turn it into a trash heap. You would just, uh, you would go to Gies Practica, you get a notary to copy that section out, and you kind of, as an inquisitor, you, you had it kind of ready made for you. They're also ordered in, in the way that you would study them for the, for the education of, you know, becoming an inquisitor yourself, so that's handy. Some of the forms even still have names and dates from previous Inquisition cases, so they function as much as a historical witness to the actual Inquisition as mere templates, though you gotta wonder about the privacy rights of those heretics. Oh yeah, it's the 14th century, no one has rights. Parts 4 and 5 are more directly compositions by Guy himself. Part 4 is actually based on a work that was produced during the Northern Italian Inquisition of around 1268 to 1277. You'll recall that that was the region that produced one of the only alleged texts that we have that survived from, a, from an alleged Cathar Dulis, the Book of the Two Principles. You can learn more about that work above if you want to get into some Cathar theology. That work, however, Guy greatly expands. Uh, the Inquisition one, not not the Cathar one. He he wouldn't do that. You know he was on he was on Team Inquisition, but basically it's a kind of running commentary describing the extent and nature of the powers of the Inquisition. There are things that they could do, and there were things that they simply couldn't do. Finally, Book Five is perhaps the most interesting and accessible for contemporary readers, and basically it's the only one that anyone reads now. Anyhow, here Guy details the nature of five distinct heretical groups. The Manichaeans, who he would, we would now call Cathars, he always calls them Manichaeans. The Waldensians, the Pseudo-Apostles, the Bechines, and then a kind of grab bag of people. Relapsed Jews, sorcerers, diviners, and those that, that summon demons. 
he knew it was going to get summoning demons. In addition to each heresy, there are also a series of interrogatoria, or questions specific to those sects, that an inquisitor should ask in order to secure membership of said heretic and said heresy. More on the interrogations and the means by which you secure those confessions. You guessed it. Torture. In a bit. But if you only know Guy from the book and the film of Umberto Eco's In the Name of the Rose, you'll have the impression of him as a kind of steely-eyed machine hell-bent on rooting out heresy no matter what the toll taken on human life and dignity. Something of a, I don't know, medieval Catholic Reinhardt Heydrich or something, God forbid. But that's actually not really the impression that you get from reading the Practica. Well, he does lament the idea of letting a single heretic go uh, rather than, you know, getting false convictions. So that's kind of troubling. It troubles him more the idea of one guy might get away than you could get a bunch of false confessions. Though Guy sees himself, as all many Inquisitors did, as doctors of the soul, honestly serving the task of rescuing souls from heresy, which would otherwise mean damnation for them. He's trying to help them. He often urges restraint and caution, and even when it comes to torture, while an option for the Inquisition since 1252, the bull ad extra panda, it was always a last resort for Guy, something that we shouldn't take for granted. We, it, it's going to change in just a minute. In fact, as we start to compare Guy and Emmerich, we're going to see two very different means by which the Inquisition should proceed. And some of that horror that Emmerich inspired for the Enlightenment guys and Edgar Allan Poe is sadly, horrifically, going to come into much clearer focus. Now, before turning to Emmerich, however, I should say a bit about the other two important manuals produced in the 14th century, both produced in the Italian context, the De Officio and the Tractatus, the later of which was printed first in 1579. These are both fundamentally legal texts. They're being written for more or less incorporating the Inquisition into existing legal structures of the day. The former outlines the role of the officials of the Inquisition, the various legal categories of heretics, and finally the tasks to be performed by the Inquisition. Again, limiting it as much as giving a power. Largely, the text spells out and clarifies what up to that to the point had been a rather haphazard legal precedence as the Inquisition developed. Again, no one knew what quite to do with this thing. The Tractatus is similar in this regard, but further intends to integrate the nature and scope of the Inquisition into the larger system of law, which was frankly still integrating the shift to Roman law in the 13th century. It's all being built at sea. Now, it does clarify several important matters of precedent, especially the use of juridical torture, more about torture later, and is more or less for an audience of jurists rather than being a manual for the inquisitors themselves, as is the case for both the books of Guy and Emmerich. Those are the textbooks for heretic, these are more textbooks for jurists. That said, the Tractatus is frankly by far the most comprehensible of any of these books to a contemporary audience, even without medieval legal training. It's basically a straightforward guide to the relationship of the Inquisition as a proto-institution to the larger legal framework of the time, including the limits on inquisitorial power. Again, they're very interested in making sure this thing is pretty circumscript for reasons we're going to get to in a minute, but it's no surprise that this book went into four editions in the 16th century alone. However, the star or protagonist of this episode, the 1376 Directorium Inquisitorum by the Catalan Chief Inquisitor for the Kingdom of Aragon, well, when he wasn't in exile from Aragon, by Nicholas Emmerich represents a sea change in nearly every aspect of the Inquisition up to that point in time, and it sets the stage for both the national and institutional Roman and Spanish Inquisitions, but also the early modern witch trials, which would go on to claim the lives of between 40 and 60,000 people from 1450 to 1750, overwhelmingly women. Indeed, it survives in 30 five manuscripts attesting to its widespread and popularity and would see 13 full editions in the 16th and 17th centuries. The 1578 thought to be the most definitive, that one composed under edition of Francisco Peña, whose notes and comments, by the way, in that text are very, very helpful if you decide to actually dare to read the thing. 
However, the text has no modern edition, no complete English translation, which is unsurprising considering it's a sprawling 800 page scholastic tome in folio. In folio, like 10 point font. However, if you're familiar with the interrogative scholastic method of the questiones, the text is surprisingly handy. It's structurally coherent and has a kind of logical flow typical of something that you would read like Aquinas or Scotus or Occam, but it's, it's about torturing people and the Inquisition. And if horrifying Inquisition manuals is what you wanted, well, that's what you'll get in the Directorium. Why you would want that, I don't know. I have a copy over there from 1578. It's a stuff of nightmares. Now, recall that I mentioned that Emmerich composed the text in exile. Yes, Emmerich had a penchant for self-righteousness, which I suppose is a virtue for inquisitors, but also he greatly expanded the net of what was going to be constitutive of heresy and thus the scope of any given inquisition. Now, this would eventually lead him on an assault against his fellow scholars, especially the scholar, the Catalan scholar, Raymond Lull, who would, he actually would get declared temporarily, at least a heretic and all his followers declared heretics along with those practicing sorcery and even non-converted Jews. Recall that typically to be a heretic, you got to first be a Christian, right? At least in Aragon, but in many other places, Jews and Muslims actually enjoyed some degree of protection directly under the crown and were thus doubly outside the jurisdiction of the Inquisition. They were not Christians and they were protected by the crown. Emmerich will begin to batter down those walls, setting the stage for the mass prosecution of Muslims and especially Jews in the 15th century, culminating in the Alhambra Decree of 1492, which eventually expelled all non-converted Jews from Spain and the subsequent Spanish Inquisition, which followed to ensure religious compliance on the part of the converts. This, this is the part where you can make the Spanish Inquisition joke from Monty Python. Oh wait. Whereas Guy's Practica is just that, it's a kind of workaday manual for the Inquisition down there in the trenches of Inquisition land, the Directorium is a more fully academic work, meant to serve as an encyclopedic manual for both training of the Inquisitors, but also for use in the day-to-day -day office of the Inquisition. It's also a kind of theater for him to argue in defense of his persecution of the followers of Romando Lull, and especially his novel focus on those who use sorcery to summon demons, in addition for him to, for him to just brag about the convictions he had secured, especially against the alleged Jewish sorcerer Astruc de Piera, over and against the royal prerogative. Just to be clear, they did not want him prosecuting this Jewish guy he did it anyway. He's innovating in this text as much as he is describing inquisition in both theory and practice. The text is normative just as much as it is descriptive. Now Emmerich's tone is often detached, though sometimes haughty, but mostly it's just coldly academic, even when systematizing the proper grounds for torture, those grounds proving all the more accessible in the directorium as we'll see in a moment. The work is divided into three parts. I feel like I'm reading Caesar all of a sudden. The first details the theological justification for the Inquisitor's task of suppressing heresy using hundreds of pages of canon law and theological tracts from Augustine to Gratian, the Decretals, various popes, and especially his fellow Dominican Thomas Aquinas. Emmerich loves Thomas. Remember when I said that the text follows the scholastic system of the Quaestiones? Well, Mm, you'll maybe recall that that's where an initial thesis is subjected to a host of objections before the central argument and the final position are stated by the author. Thomas does a pretty good job of that. Scotus does a good job of that. Emmerich pretty much softballs those initial objections and mostly cherry picks the historical data to justify the existence and role of the Inquisition, especially as he defines it. It all appears very academic when you actually look at the text on the surface, but with more reflection, it really comes across as, as cheap, cheating even. It's not, it's not good academic work. For Emmerich, the Inquisition is a foregone conclusion, and this section provides what is effectively a veneer, now a thick one, hundreds of pages, 
but only a really veneer of scholastic justification, especially for the finer points where he's really pushing the Inquisition into novel territory. We'll see a similar pattern in his arguments for extending the Inquisition's jurisdiction to non-Christians and for his arguments for the heretification of magic. The second section outlines how Emmerich understands heresy. Again, taken from canon law and taken from theology along with the standard encyclopedia of the sects of his time and the times just before him, and thus, of course, what to do with said heretics. Of course, the standard heretics here are enumerated, you Manichaeans and Cathars and Waldensians and blah blah blah, but Emmerich also spells a lot of time on his pet heretics, the Lullians, the followers of Romando Lull, adhered, as you might know, to a computational system which they allege was able to prove the truths of Christianity. It was kind of able to prove the truths of anything. All these cool wheels and you turn them and you could like logically prove things. It's like early computational science. Lowell would also become associated with alchemy and sorcery in the generations after his death, giving him an even more sinister veneer, though there's no evidence he had anything to do with any of that. Probably hated it. Emmerich, for his part, thought the whole matter entirely heretical and singled them out for prosecution. His argument basically is you can't compute your way to faith. He would also argue for the persecution of non-Christians, especially Jews, along with those who engage in the conjuration of demons. Now we're going to spend a lot of time on that last part, the conjuration of demons part, because it's esoterica, so hold on to that just for a bit. But all in all, this section establishes the what and the who of heresy and attempts to argue for the expansion, the big expansion of the jurisdiction of inquisitorial powers. Finally, the third section lays out the nature and role of the inquisitor and the process of inquisition itself. These sections are among the most horrible as they detail means by which to basically trick people into confession. The detailed discussion of when and how to apply torture, including greatly lowering the bar for when torture can be applied, basically any suspicion of heresy is sufficient for Emmerich to begin the process of torturing people, and his argument for the continuation of torture much longer, much longer than what was traditionally allowed through inquisitional jurisprudence. Again, they were rules. Emmerich breaks them. Emmerich even sometimes eschews the importance of penance, otherwise so key in inquisitional theory, given that he suspects that most heretics, they're already possessed by demons and is essentially damned by the time they arrive for inter interrogation in the first place. The confession is just a procedural in his thinking to some degree to ultimately arrive at the show trial of the Thermogenerales. Here, Emmerich contends that it is the public humiliation and horrible execution of the heretic that functions both as a stand-in for the devil, you're, you're burning the devil to some degree, but also as a deterrent for any would-be heretics out there lurking in the crowd. Writing in exile, again, this is written in exile, one can detect Emmerich's fury, his sense of self-importance, and the directorium comes across much more as how the Inquisition should be run if Nicholas was in charge of it, rather than how it was in fact run. Yet, Emmerich would have the last laugh, and the directorium would dramatically shape the trajectory of both the 16th century Roman and Spanish Inquisitions, but as I mentioned, it would lay the groundwork for the early modern witch trials. Now, as you can probably detect, there is a surprising, shocking amount of difference between the Inquisition of the time of Guy in the early 14th century, in the period where the Practica was uh, composed, and the Inquisition 50 years later, just 50 years later, around the time that the composition of the 1376 Directorium was written by Emmerich. For instance, the funding structure of the Inquisition would actually change. In Guy's day, he was directly employed by the French state that largely paid inquisition from confiscations, especially of land taken from convicted heretics and those that supported them. Recall that in Guy's lifetime, the Cathars were undergoing basically the final stages of their annihilation, and the period of the confiscations, frankly, were coming, they were coming to an end, meaning an end to the large revenue streams that were funding the very inquisition in those regions. Worse, at least, for the funding of the Inquisition was that the new crop of heretics, especially the spiritual Franciscans and the Apostolic Brethren, well, remember they were hereticated precisely on the grounds of their commitment to radical apostolic 
poverty. And their charge that the Roman church was antichrist because of its riches, among other reasons, well, it should be obvious they didn't have any money or land to confiscate upon their conviction, unlike the previous generations of lords that were said to have sheltered the Cathar Perfecti. Emmerich even complains that there aren't any rich heretics left. He complains about this. And I gotta admit, it's kind of funny, it's just to have him huffing and puffing, and, oh, sure, I had some rich heretics to prosecute. If I'm gonna be honest, it's kind of funny, it's horrible, but it's also kind of funny. However, as available confiscations dried up, the Inquisition was basically forced to rely on bishops to fund their work, and it turns out, bishops don't care. They got other things to do, and they're rich. They don't want to get involved in all this Inquisition business most of the time? No. Or do you got to basically fundraise via penalties imposed upon penitent heretics, or the rare confiscation you get from the spiritual Franciscans that you just burned? On the balance sheet, this does actually work out better for the state. Though, they do actually complain when they do get some confiscations. They, those confiscations end up in the Inquisitor's purses and not the state's. And it also has the effect that it gave the Inquisition greater autonomy. They weren't financially dependent upon the state anymore. It also had the effect of increasing financial penalties upon convicted heretics over and against penances such as wearing crosses or prison time or forced pilgrimage that were more common in Guy's day. You were more likely to, some, to sentence them to some kind of financial penalty and along with some other penances because how was she going to you know, burn the, 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 the spiritual Franciscans over there? Now, this greater amount of autonomy didn't always work out for the Inquisitor. Guy, for his part, was a very careful diplomat. Remember, he worked in that capacity as a professional prior to ever even becoming an inquisitor. But he also saw himself as appointed directly by God via the Pope to work for the French state in Toulouse. Thus, he really didn't... He wasn't much of a guy who rocked the boat for a lot of reasons. Now, he did resent the papal bulls, which did come out during his lifetime, which forced any inquisition to work in tandem with local bishops for approval of torture and major trials. They had to basically get a, a signature from the bishop to torture people and conduct major trials. Now, these were the result of some recent troubles, let's call them, where there were basically riots by the local population when an inquisition got out of hand and tried to subject an entire city to, to trial. But there's no evidence that Guy aroused local anger or royal anger for that matter. Indeed, he was actually very, very careful in his Sermo Generales to very clearly articulate his verdicts using evidence and even speaking in the vernacular Occitan for key sections of those speeches so that the crowd could follow along. Yeah, it was a show trial, but it was a show trial that the crowd had to agree with. At least they had to come along with it to some degree, and Guy knew that from his own experience in the riots that broke out in Carcassonne. Unlike popular imagination, the Inquisition of this period just couldn't do anything they wanted with impunity. By no means. People would just riot and kill them. And he saw that in Carcassonne. Now, Emmerich, however, because of his greater autonomy, the basic lack of other heretics for him to prosecute, and his conviction that blasphemy, sorcery, and some other Jews fell into his jurisdiction, along with the followers of Romando Lul, he began to target a wider swath of people, including members of the court. From his writings, it appears that he wanted to target sorcerers, some alchemists, and certain astrologers as heretics. Now, this was a wholly novel move. This has not been done before. And worse, many of those that he wanted to target were members of the elite. They were members of the court, and they were even members of his own order. They were Dominicans. Now, this cut two ways. In one way, it allowed for greater possibility of conf confiscations. With new forms of heresy came new heretics, some of them very wealthy. Though, interestingly enough, Emmerich does actually complain that such a direct funding of the Inquisition through direct confiscations, well, that created a significant conflict of interest. I mean, Emmerich at least admits that. But, as he would learn, on the other hand, the locals and the lords were also deeply off-put by him targeting Jews, Lullists, and many others for those sorcery prosecutions because that brought a host of members of the court into his net. 
Indeed, this whole region had a reputation for sorcery and mysticism and astrology. Recall that the Zohar had produced not far away from here over in Castile under the rule of Alfonso X just a century prior. Also, he was one of the few European monarchs that flatly refused to host the Inquisition in any form or fashion. I mean, the dude wasn't called Alfonso the Wise for nothing. The Picatrix was also translated at this time. Several different magical manuals are being produced through the 13th century and introduced in the 14th. Michael Ryan's book, by the way, A Kingdom of Stargazers, does a fantastic job describing this whole occulty 14th century Spanish milieu. But Emmerich's expansion of his jurisdiction earned him the ire of the secular arm, and they sent him into exile when he would ultimately end up writing the Directorium himself. So again, the secular arm wasn't always eager or even willing to aid the Inquisition in certain situations. It's especially when those situations involved it turning on them. Now, it's often passed over because of the horrible torture stuff that it's, it's forgotten that the official goal of the Inquisition is the deracination of heresy from a local area, and more importantly, for the abjuration of convicted heretics in the interest of reconciling their souls to God and securing their salvation. Indeed, the earliest Inquisition was devised in the aftermath of the Albigensian Crusades because killing heretics massacring heretics, much less massacring innocent Christians, wasn't the goal of the church. And you can't provide salvation to a bunch of people who you just massacred at Bézier. You cannot help massacred, unrepentant heretics. Now, many people out there, maybe y'all, are cynical about these motives, but those are the stated motives of the church via the Inquisition, and we have to be honest about that. But how does one get from the detection of heresy to the ultimate abjuration of heresy and reconciliation with the church? Well, through the process of interrogation, aided of course by torture, and then confession before final public abjuration in the Sermo Generales, or the public sermon, where the various verdicts of the Inquisition were announced, a sermon was preached to the, popula to the population, and the condemned were relaxed to the secular arm outside the church for execution, of course, most often through burning. And it's in the interrogation of heresy where Guy and Emmerich can, again, be very revealingly contrasted. As I mentioned, Guy does see himself, and I do believe him, as he sees himself as a doctor of souls and seems to honestly wish to cure souls of damnable heresy. However, he knows that the heretic can employ guile and trickery to conceal their positions and protect their confederates. Specifically, he notes the use of a range of linguistic tricks, especially employed by the Waldensians and the Apostolic Brethren, the pseudo-apostles, whereby they employ a series of equivocations to lead the Inquisitor to believe that they assent to orthodoxy, where they just actually are agreeing that they believe that the Inquisitor believes in orthodoxy. It's a funny trick, and at least from the text, I kind of believe that Guy himself might be speaking from experience. I think he must have fallen for this trick at some point. You know, the old Waldensian, I believe that you believe. Otherwise, the suspected heretic might feign stupidity. They might just say, I have no idea what to believe. Tell me what to believe, and I'll tell you what to believe. To avoid questioning, and Guy provides a wide-ranging list of questions the interrogatoria of Book 5, specific to each heresy to help guide the suspect toward confessing. Yes, leading confessions, leading questions, were the rule to the uh, interrogation system of the Inquisition, not the exception. Leading questions, all day, every day, here at Inquisition time. Once the confession was secured, penances could be made and the abjuration reconciles the patient to the salvation of the Mother Church. However, if that failed, if the interrogation did not result in a confession or some other form of acquittal, and there was still strong suspicion of heresy, and as a last resort, Guy does advise the use of torture. More on that in a moment. Now, as you can probably predict, the situation in Emmerich is rather different. Rather than lay out five distinct heresies as Guy does, Emmerich cast a wide net as possible in his definition of heresy. It basically includes any beliefs or practices that insult or threaten the mother church. 
Further, Emmerich is beginning at this time already to begin to link heresy with diabolism and thus with demonic possession. For him, the odds that anyone indulging in heresy has already surrendered their soul to the devil in this life such that, well, he can do very little to save them at this point. Thus, his task, to his mind, is to extract a confession as quickly as possible to make an example of that alleged penitent so as to help the next would-be heretic. Thus, Imric is willing to fight fire with fire in the interrogation. He's, he's dealing with the devil, he thinks. And he lists ten kotulai, or rules that an inquisitor can use to basically trick a person into confessing. Now, he knows that he can't outright lie, but he can employ a range of pretty dirty tricks. The worst among them, at least to me, is his own use of equivocation on the Latin word for grace, or gratia, which can mean both grace and pardon in Latin, such that he would offer them gratia, pardon, in exchange for a confession. What the suspect hears, of course, are they being basically, they're given the chance to confess and the charges being dismissed. It's a charges being dismissed in exchange for confession situation. What Emmerich means is in the technical sense of the theological idea of grace, gratia, as a pardon given to those who confess to be reconciled with the Mother Church, even if it means their confessions damning them to be burned alive. There's something disgusting about this. Other tricks include feigning having documents that damn the suspect and threatening to use them, threatening to leave them in the dungeon when chains for long periods of time while the Inquisitor is out there doing Inquisition stuff. By the way, Guy also threatened to do this. Uh, Emmerich's getting this from Guy, so you're not getting off the hook, Guy. Uh, telling them that their Confederates have ratted them out, prisoner's dilemma, putting them in fetters for a while while then giving them just food and water and then bettering their conditions and offering them even better conditions if they confess. Visitations for their family, the use of turncoats like jailhouse informants, and of course, finally comes the threat and reality of torture. Now, many of these techniques are kind of known to us from like crime dramas or like Zero Dark Thirty, Zero Dark Inquisition, but their duplicity is even for me so grossly shocking because they're coming from an alleged son of God acting to save the soul of his parishioners. Torture, as I mentioned earlier, has been an interrogative tool for inquisitors since around 1252, about 30 years into the Inquisition. For 30 years, the Inquisition could not use torture, FYI. Though inquisitorial torture was heavily circumscribed, and it usually was limited to the strapado. Only one session of torture was allowed per day, and just at all, only one session was allowed, and under depositions that were made under torture had to be confirmed in writing outside of torture. The tortured confessions were not sufficient to achieve conviction. Indeed, torture was introduced when sufficient evidence of heresy existed, but not enough to secure a conviction, the archetype form of evidence being personal confession. Thus, torture was intended to, quote, make truth pour through torment and bodily suffering. Though evidence arrived at solely through torture was universally reviewed as suspect, because people know then what we know now that with sufficient torture, virtually anyone will confess to virtually anything. And it's unclear to what degree Guy employed torture in his over 630 acts recorded in his Sententiae, a lengthy document recording the outcomes of his various inquisitorial cases. I include a great book that has an analysis of the outcome of all these cases he adjudicated. Further, what is clear is that he felt that torture should be employed as a last resort, and only when very strong suspicion of heresy based on other evidence was available. For the practica, torture was a means to secure a weaker, though still likely case of heresy, or when it might be possible to decisively secure information from a central node in a heretic network. This is something like the, I don't know, the ticking time bomb scenarios that they use in movies to justify torturing people. That we have to get to this one guy because he's linked to all the other ones, and if we get that one guy, then, you know, we can save everyone else's soul. Something like that. In this way, Guy continues as a relatively restrained implementation of torture typical of the early period of the Inquisition, especially compared to the secular arm, folks, in which torture of people was 
just as much entertainment as it was a judicial process. So again, we have to compare the Inquisition to its time period and not ours. In fact, it was a tendency toward early, sustained, violent, and widespread torture that helped spurned on that riot at Carcassonne that Guy remembered all too well. I think he referred to it as the rage at Carcassonne, the rabes carcassonionis. And for what it's worth, those two Italian manuals that I've been mentioning, they basically follow Guy and they follow the precedent of restrained torture as their last result, only once, typically only with a strapado, and any confession that arrived at torture had to be secured outside of torture for it to be admissible. Of course, with Emmerich, story's a bit different. The Directorium imagines a kind of spectrum from interrogation to what we would now call psychological pressure, even psychological torture, before finally arriving at physical torture. But what separates Emmerich is both his rationalization of the process of when an inquisitor could introduce torture, the systematic transition from psychological to physical torture itself, and finally how long torture could be sustained. Unlike inquisitorial precedent and previous manuals, all of the previous manuals, Emmerich argued that one could introduce torture as soon as a suspect provides inconsistent, confused, or even hesitant testimony on doctrinal questions. You should just be able to know all of Catholic doctrine upon ask, even if there were no other evidence that would elevate their status of suspicion, nor other evidence that might establish their guilt. Of course, no one brought into the Inquisition is going to have a straight story or a, a robust theological education to exactly answer every question right. And given that Emmerich is happy to use those various ruses to induce confusion, this de facto establishes that torture becomes virtually accessible as soon as the heretic speaks. Or doesn't. Hesitancy opens the door. As I mentioned, the canonical form of torture here was the strapado, where the victim is bound with, uh, with, with rope tied with their hands behind their backs. They're lifted into the air with sometimes weight attached to their feet. They're raised and lowered into the air. Sometimes the rope is struck um, and it sends vibrations down to their body. It's all meant to cause agony on torn and ripped muscles and ligaments, desperately trying to hold together the horribly distended and dislocated shoulders of, of the victim. The idea that serpado torture is somehow more humane, something that the inquisitors argued is... <sighs> Emmerich, for his part, draws this process out slowly, increasingly proximate to the implements of torture, showing you the ropes and the pulleys, binding your hands, lifting you slowly into the air for various periods of time, before then attaching weights, bouncing the victim up and down and striking the rope that suspends them. Further, Emmerich argues that the victim actually might just... they might just be demonically possessed, remember, and thus they're magically immune to the pain of torture. Hence, it might be necessary to extend the process of torture, even if they aren't confessing. Now, prior to the directorium, torture was restricted, as I mentioned, to a single day per accused victim, and again, only as a last resort. For his part, Emmerich argues that as long as the interrogation must continue, it's all one long interrogation. And thus, if torture happens on subsequent days, he isn't repeating the torture, which was forbidden to inquisitors. He wasn't repeating it. He was just continuing it. Thus, for Emmerich, torture had been subject to a certain rationalization, considerably lowering the threshold for when torture could begin in the interrogation process, as he had introduced a distinctly psychological component to the process, and it could be continued well beyond what was previously considered orthodox by inquisitorial standards. As one might imagine, following the directorium, torture becomes increasingly the one-stop shop for producing evidence in the centuries that followed for both the Roman and the Spanish Inquisitions, and, of course, with the early modern witch trials. All right, now we get to the part about the magic. I don't know how this episode got so long. Let me talk to my editor. I am the... 
All right, let's talk about the differences between the practica and the directorium here that matter, I think, to most of us. The heretification of magic, and again, probably what you were here for all along. Sorry about the weight. I mean, there was a section there about torture to tide you over, but... In general, attitudes toward magic, especially learned magic, were already beginning to shift in the early 13th century, probably because of the proliferation toward the end of the previous century, which saw the translation of the Picatrix, the likely composition of the Ars Notoria, along with the Swarm Book of Honorius, along with a ton of other magical texts that have now been lost, all foundational textbooks of Western magic. Thus, the church was actually confronted with a weird situation. It was, it was confronted with a wave of learned magic, perhaps for the first time in 500 years, and the first such trials for the use of magic began to noticeably increase in the late 13th, but especially in the 14th century. Now, the, the church had already basically laid out the, its position on the sin of magic, not the heresy of magic. That's coming. Now magic is just a sin in the papal bull of Alexander IV, Accusatus, in 1260, which concluded that fortune-telling and the casting of spells, divitationes et sorilegii, did not, did not fall under the jurisdiction of the Inquisition unless nisi heresim apparent manifeste. It smelled or savored of manifest heresy. I rather like how sensual the test is and it kind of reminds me of u.s laws like on obscenity like u.s obscenity laws basically something is obscene if a judge looks at it and says it's obscene they kind of know it when they see it the acquisitus both forecloses upon the inquisitorial jurisdiction when it comes to the prosecution of magic but it also leaves open the possibility with that weird peculiar clause about savoring manifest heresy so to continue using that language, what could flavor magic such that it ceases to be a mere sin among various sins worthy only of confession, maybe to a bishop, and penance to becoming heresy, and thus requiring the intercession of the Inquisition? The central concern is not the casting of spells, but the operation of magic through demonic means when the procedure involves latria and dulia of said demons, that is, giving worship and reverence to demonic beings, otherwise uniquely reserved for God, Mary, and the saints, in exchange for the efficient causation unique to demons. Well, magic. Such latria and dulia could tilt the scales from magic as a mere sin to magic as a heresy. Now, for his part, Guy dedicates very little attention to magic in the Practica, only basically affirming what the church had already made clear. Magic was ultimately demonic in nature. It was a pestis et error, disease and an error. And in hundreds of trials Guy presided over, there is actually basically no evidence of magic being an important issue, maybe not even an issue in all, 600 and something plus trials. And in other cases where magic was present in an inquisitorial proceeding of that time period, it's almost always just an adjunct aspect of a larger heresy case. It's the heresy matters. The magic is just propping up the heresy. Now that change is going to come first with Pope John the 22nd, and then in a more substantial way with, surprise, surprise, Emmerich's directorium. Now in 1317, it was revealed that the Bishop of Cahors had actually attempted to assassinate Pope John the 22nd by using both physical poison, but also death magic. And of course, that bishop was discovered and eventually burned alive for the plot. But in 1320, the Pope wrote a letter to the Inquisitors of Toulouse and Carcassonne asking them to, uh, hey guys, do me a solid. Could you, uh, could you look into that whole demon summoning stuff? Because one of your bishops nearly killed me with it. Now, he's probably just paying lip service when Guy actually puts that question in the short remarks in the Practica. Because... He just asked him to look into it, and he's probably just mentioning it to make sure that the Pope sees it. However, the Pope doesn't just leave the question to the Inquisitors. He also turns to a battery of theologians and canon lawyers to better clarify the relationship between magic, sin, and heresy. He wants to get this whole thing sorted out concretely. Now, the answers that they give are actually split. And to understand why they're split, we should divide magic into three groups. The first do involve giving Dulia and Latria for demons in exchange for their efficient causation. 
Well, those are always heretical and fully fall under the jurisdiction of the Inquisition. No one ever doubted that, that's basically what Accusatus says. However, other forms of magic, like using gems to produce various kinds of marvelous effects, or reading the hands of a person, chiromancy, they're similarly worrisome, but they're just using hidden signs in nature to various ends, and while they can be sinful, they're not necessarily so, and they're certainly not heresy. However, there is a middle test here. However, there are clearly cases where demons can be employed, can be summoned, though without giving them Dulia or Latria, even torturing them into the employ of the necromancer. Now that doesn't seem like heresy at all. Perhaps it's even praiseworthy to crush demons under the thumb of a righteous priest like D&D paladin style, to force them to do good for a change, like go clean the church, or put my books back on the shelf, or dust this damn place, please. However, Thomas Aquinas disagreed. Yeah, Thomas ruins our fun. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, for Thomas, there's a kind of tacit agreement with the demons, a kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you know, that I know that, you know, kind of situation between the necromancer and the demonic being that he was allegedly impelling. There is a tacit kind of, well, deal being struck here. However, even with this tacit agreement or the Takita for Thomas, most canon lawyers and theologians actually sided with the precedent concluding that such cases, while sinful, still can't summon demons if you don't give them uh, dulia, they weren't matters of heresy. They simply were not privately held, publicly taught, conscious deviations from orthodoxy. In fact, this kind of necromancy could be well within the structure of orthodoxy. Again, Thomas disagrees. Now, John the 22nd, probably because of the magical plot to kill him, was pretty interested in the Inquisition making this some heresy and then rooting it the hell out of there. So he followed the minority descending voice on the panel, folks like Enrico de Corretto and more so Guido Torini, and, and to agree with the Bishop Inquisitor to himself become Pope Jacques Fournier, and in 1326, Pope John the 22nd issued the Bull Super Elias Specula, which came a hair's breadth from making basically all magic, especially magic involving demons or supernatural beings in any form or fashion, patent heresy, and thus under the jurisdiction of the Inquisition. However, a close reading of the bull actually reveals the Pope was still trying to balance the majority precedental view of Accusatus with the minority dissent that demonic magic was always heresy. So, the bull seems to basically had no effect. There's really no uptick in magical persecutions during this period, and it isn't even mentioned again in the historical record so far as we can tell until our boy Emmerich invokes it in the Directorium 50 years after it was issued. Why? Probably because law then, like law now, follows precedent. And the bull is so weakly worded that it is hard to use it to, you, to achieve the escape velocity one would need for the very firm ruling of Akuzatus. Secondly, and I think this is more interesting, is that if magic were to have been pursued vigorously by the Inquisition, it may have proved to have been an absolute disaster. Why? Because it was precisely churchmen and ranking nobles that were the only people at this time that were really capable of even performing such magic. And as I mentioned earlier, there was a ton of magic around. The prosecutions would have turned on a population endemic to the church itself, along with the very nobles that hobnob with them. It could have proven an inquisition on the church. That was kind of what they were pointing to prevent with the spiritual audiences and all these people and the nobles that supported them. So, no, that, 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 wasn't, that wasn't gonna happen. They were not going to unleash inquisitors on the clerical necromanding underground. And like I said, from what we can tell, it had no effect. Guy doesn't even mention it, but he does mention the invocation of demons in the context of the Practica. Again, probably just a tip of the hat to John the 22nd, more than anything else. And the two Italian inquisition manuals we've been talking about, they don't mention it either. Again, they follow Accusatus, they follow the precedent. Necromancy is a sin, maybe it needs to be judged by a bishop, but definitely not by the Inquisition. 
That is until Emmerich's directorium comes along where he accepts the dissenting minority view and he builds up a series of arguments that any invocation of demons is tantamount to at least Latria via making a pact with them either explicitly or implicitly, Takita, as Thomas Aquinas had had it. Torini, for his part, had argued that while such invocation wasn't manifest heresy, it should be enough to suspectus de fide incorrendus. It should be investigated as suspect in faith. Now, that sounds like we're getting into Inquisition territory, and to be sure, we're definitely getting there. But Emmerich, leaning on Thomas Aquinas, mounts up the argument that invocation is tacit latria. How? because invocation required an agreement or pact of exchange with the demon. Why else would a demon do something for someone? They gotta be getting something out of the deal, such that the necromancer agreed, either openly or takita, tacitly, to trade or at least jeopardize their soul in exchange for access to alleged demonic efficient causation. Demonic efficient causation. Band name alert. Yeah, it's alleged demonic efficient causation, because remember back to Augustine and Book 9 of the City of God, the church's position is that demons can only perform illusions and not real changes in nature without divine sanction, that is. Thus, magic is always basically just a long con to damn the would-be necromancer by the demon in question. The demon can't really do magic, and they can just trick stupid necromancers into believing that they can. For Emmerich, such a pact, trading the eternal soul for worldly power or even jeopardizing the soul, operated as a kind of inverse sacrament contra the salvific power of the Eucharist, for instance, both engaging in sacrilege but also revealing the incorrect belief, belief that the devil had similar powers to God, to provide the necromancer those kinds of powers that he wanted through the pact with the demon and the demonic efficient causation. That implicit belief Recall, heresy just literally means belief in the power of the demonic to have the power of the godly. That was an issue of doctrine, and thus any magic which invoked demons can be concluded to be heretical and should be investigated and thus fall under the persecution, under the jurisdiction of the Inquisition. It's a clever argument. I mean... I see what you're doing, Emmerich. I, I appreciate it. Of course, the proof of the pudding is in the tasting, and it's clear from Emmerich's action that he took this line of reasoning to heart. How do we know that? Because he began inquisitions into magic and magicization practices and beliefs, especially forms of astro astrology practice in the Kingdom of Aragon. And recall what happened. After pressing the issue, with just that being magic and astrology being very much in vogue among some clerics and some nobles, Emmerich was exiled. He was given the boot. He lost the support of the secular arm and local religious leaders. Very probably, the potential of the prosecutions would have set off a social firestorm. Even his prosecution of an alleged Jewish sorcerer Emmerich also argued that the Inquisition should be able to proceed against non-Christians who violate religious laws that both Christians and those non-Christians share in common. In this case, the prohibition on sorcery, at least as far as Emmerich understood it, was a potential social problem because the Jews fell directly under the protection of the Aragonese crown and were economically and socially important as a minority in the kingdom. That's something the king knew, something the nobles knew, and it wasn't at all in the interest, socially or economically, for his realm, for inquisitors to be targeting Jewish people. So, Emmerich got exiled. They kicked them the hell out. And in his exile, he, he put pen to paper, composing the directorium. And slowly through the 14th century, while magic persecution cases in the rest of Europe remain basically flat in Aragon, where Emmerich's influence could be directly felt, you begin to slowly see the cases begin to rise. With the proliferation of the directorium, magic, especially magic involving any invocation of spirits, demons, or packs, would be now slowly hereditated all over Europe, no longer a mere sin, 
but heresy and now under the eye of the Inquisition. Again, this is precisely because of the logic that an implicit or explicit pact with demons could only effectuate such magic, and anyone doing such magic knew and believed this. It was a belief. It was a race. It was a belief. Of course, this set learned magical practices, learned magical practices like ceremonial magic encoded in books requiring Latin and religious education, costly, fabulous outfits and equipment directly into the sites of the Inquisition. And yet, with only a few set exceptions, such as Cecco Descoli, you can check out an episode about him and him being burned alive for astrological necromancy, the Inquisition conspicuously avoided virtually all such prosecutions. I wonder why. However, it would be Johannes Niders' Formicarius, written between 1436 and 1438, that would extend the idea of diabolism from learned magic to witchcraft or malefica, typically associated with unlearned women, and form the theological connective tissue between Emmerich's Directorium and the 1486 Malleus Maleficarum. Those cases would be pursued, of course, with horrible vigor, killing tens of thousands of, well, mostly women. That text, in a substantive sense, ignited the early modern witch trials, and I have a whole another episode about the Malleus Maleficarum. Nicholas Emmerich, in a sense, transformed inquisitions into an inquisition, the inquisition. And we still live with the legacy of that shift today. Now, there's so much more to discuss in the Inquisition of the 14th century, even more just on Guy and Emmerich, like the fact that Guy seems less evil, at least in part, but Emmerich actually allows a built-in system of appeals that could go directly to the Pope and prevent torture or even prevent the whole trial from proceeding. At least in Emmerich's system, their appeals. Guy's? Not so much. Or the pageantry and performative theater that was the Sermo Generales, became the auto de fe in the Spanish Inquisition. That said, the medieval Inquisition and its developments in the 14th century are decisive in Western history, and yet they go vastly understudied. The rest of stuff I've studied around here, most people, even people interested in Western esotericism or magic, etc., they've never even heard or studied Guy or Emmerich, and frankly, it's not their fault. It's not their fault at all. I mean, there's no modern edition or translation of either text. They remain totally buried in a mountain of obscurity, despite their incredible importance to history. However, if you want to do a careful study of both, at least in secondary literature, you absolutely can't do any better than Derek Hill's Inquisition in the 14th century. Why, I actually own several copies of both of those books. They are positively ponderous tomes. And without Hill's work, I couldn't have made this episode for sure. So, Derek Hill, thank you for your work. Folks, get that book. It's amazing. You can also read the fifth section of Guy's Practica and Wakefield and Evans' Heresies of the High Middle Ages, a book that anyone watching this show should own. It's fantastic. I'll also include some other important books in the description, along with the historical texts, unless you want to go, you know, look them up over in archive.org or Google Books. You can at least peruse the Practica and the Directorium there, so witness the horror from afar. But I don't think we're done with this period. Not at all. I don't think we're done at all. So more Inquisition... So more Inquisition... So more Inquisition topics, even just in the 13th century, to come. You can tell I kind of find this stuff fascinating. But I want to thank you. If you've made it this long, if you've watched this whole video, my God, you should get a medal. You've been subjected to the Inquisition. Thank you. Thank you for watching. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thanks for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.